physical exhibition and the book all explore a series of key themes and ideas um, that I kind of think of as a curatorial scaffold, scaffolding that um, tethers together the artworks and the ideas. We're looking at um, digital intimacies, the way that the internet brings us together, particularly in times of COVID, but also the way that it's really socially, socially divisive. We're looking at um, fake news and the weaponization of so social media, as we saw with um, the Brexit campaign and you know, the um, Cambridge Analytica scandal. We're looking at this idea of the human and the machine or click workers, gig workers, um, and the way that um, you know, the digital economy has inform in informed labor rights. And that's obviously the subject for tonight's talk. And we're also looking at this idea that data is the new oil and the idea of surveillance capitalism um, as detailed by uh, theorist Shoshana Zuboff, the idea that like every click, every like and every online engagement that we um, enact online is harvested, aggregated, matched, traded and sold um, towards machine learning algorithms or um, targeted marketing initiatives. And we're gonna be talking a lot about machine learning algorithms tonight and actually unpacking some of these complex terms as well. So yeah, I might just introduce the artists. We've got Simon Denny, who is um, a Berlin-based artist from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Great to see some of Simon's family in the audience tonight. Um, and Simon's work uh, chronicles the, um, the work of technologists and their relationships to politics and society. Elisa Giardina Papa is an Italian media artist whose research driven practice examines how effective labor is being reframed by digital economies and automation. So we're talking about acts of care when we're talking about effective labor. Um, and Eugenia Lim, uh, who is here in, in spirit, um, is a Melbourne-based artist. Um, she's Australian, she's of Chinese and Singaporean descent, and she works across video performance and installation to explore national identity. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, quickly share screen. Great to talk through um, Eugenia Lim's work that's currently on display at UQ Art Museum. So this is a really um, phenomenal work called On Demand and it explores obviously the on-demand economy and what you're looking at here is um, four bicycle powered, um, or four bikes essentially, that power a video work and they're kind of resting on this um, pixelated surface made of blue carpet tiles that sort of recall, you know, that blue tonal palette of the big tech disruptors like Facebook and Microsoft. And um, then there's this uh, almost industrial scaffolding structure that supports a large scale video screen. And the work is a bicycle powered video work um, that's activated through audience engagement. And through audience engagement, I suppose the artist is making us complicit in thinking about um, our relationship to uh, the gig economy. The video work itself is a work that's made in collaboration with what Eugenia terms worker performers. And she actually worked with um, workers from uh, Uber and Airtasker to make um, a choreographed movement based video work. Over the top, um, she narrates uh, various experiences by the gig workers. And um, she's sort of problematizing the gig economy and thinking through the way in which these, um, these structures provide the, um, the conditions for labor to occur, but without the workers' rights that um, other industries deliver, you know, like um, sick leave or holiday pay, these sorts of things. Um, the work's also a homage to a feminist conceptual artist called Merle Lader, Lederman Euclides, um, who was the unsalaried worker of the New York Sanitation Department from 1977. And she made these sort of worker ballets um, as well with sanitation workers. Um, yeah, uh, 
I guess for me, one of the reasons why this works also in the show is um, I think it references the way in which um, users' bodies can kind of power the system. And, um, you know, it makes me think about the way in which uh, Uber isn't necessarily a transport company, you know, they're sort of a data collection company and um, really we are we are the workers sort of behind that machine that are, that are powering the system. So I'm going to stop sharing now and um, I'm going to hand you over to Simon. Um, Simon, if you'd like to take it away, um, we've got your phenomenal work in the show. Um, yeah, all yours. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and thank you uh, to everybody uh, for being here tonight. Um, and also nice to be uh, sharing a screen also with um, Elisa. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I am going to speak to some of the work in my show, but also uh, in the show rather, um, but also some adjacent works that kind of inform some of the themes um, around uh, the exhibition that Anna just outlined. Um, so I'm going to also share my screen um, and, oh, hang on a minute, actually I might just stop that and then try again. Mm. Right. Um, so uh, my interest in this um, kind of theme um, has been kind of longer. Um, uh, and I've been kind of working around it for a little bit of time, but it sort of, um, uh, I guess, came together um, in uh, around the time that I was working on an exhibition for another show in Australia that I made um, in Tasmania um, at the uh, Museum of Old and New Art, um, which uh, was a really special moment for me, a very long research project, which is really uh, a... Um, a luxury um, and one of the things that really informed uh, my thoughts around the time of putting this work together was um, this image that you see right now of this amazing diagram uh, called the anatomy of an AI system which is also in the exhibition in Brisbane um, done by two really amazing um, thinkers, researchers, artists, I don't know they're so multidisciplinary, Kate Crawford and, and Vlad and Jola um, and uh, that was this kind of giant um, uh, giant, oh, wait a minute, yeah, giant image of, uh, of trying to kind of put everything into one diagram um, that uh, was um, making one single piece of AI machinery work. And they just picked this Amazon um, uh, smart speaker um, and they tried to put kind of everything from the invention of science to, uh, you know, uh, minerals from the ground all the way through to big stacks of infrastructure around the world um, and then kind of waste systems, like kind of everything that they could possibly think of that actually makes these systems that often look very ephemeral work. Um, and they also did some amazing writing around that. Um, and this is a little quote uh, that really inspired me. Um, it says, uh, it's necessary to move beyond a simple analysis of the relationship between an individual human, their data and any single technology company in order to contend with the truly planetary scale of extraction. There are deep interconnections between the literal hollowing out of the minerals of the earth and biosphere and the data capture and monetization of human practices of commercial, of communication and sociality. Thinking about extraction requires thinking about labor, resources and data together. This presents a challenge uh, to critical and popular understandings of artificial intelligence. It's hard to see any of these processes individually, let alone collectively. Hence the need for a visualization that can bring these connected but globally dispersed processes into a single map. So they were like talking about what inspired them to kind of make that map, that image. Um, but I think it could have as easily for me been talking to, um, you know, my own motivations for um, producing um, artwork and installations. Um, because I think it does exactly that as well. Take these very hard to feel, hard to um, uh, kind of, you know, imagine even um, phenomena and tries to put it in something where you can feel something and see something in a more tangible way. And um, explicitly in this research as well, they had this other really amazing dive into patenting by Amazon. Um, and uh, here I'm going to read another little bit because um, it, it also highlights something that turned into a sculpture for me. Um, Hidden among the thousands of other publicly available patents owned by Amazon, um, 
patent number 9 million and something, represents an extraordinary illustration of worker alienation, a stark moment in the relationship between humans and machines. It depicts a metal cage intended for the worker, equipped with different cybernetic add-ons that can be moved through a warehouse by the same motorized system that shifts shelves filled with merchandise. Here, the worker becomes part of a machinic ballet held upright in a cage, which dictates and constrains their movement. As we've seen time and time again uh, in the research for our map, dystopian futures are built upon the unevenly distributed dystopian regimes of the past and present, scattered throughout uh, an array of production chains and modern technical devices. Um, yeah, anyway, so uh, this, is, this is showing this amazing kind of like uh, diagram that they found. Um, which I then kind of looked into further. When they first published this uh, in 2018, it made a bit of a splash in the news. Um, so here's a couple of the headlines that kind of show exactly what this patent was supposed to be uh, for. Um, in, uh, in these, this is a little, uh, again, some more news that was produced around that moment, but like you can see these robots, these kind of orange things that move around inside Amazon's more automated, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, lagers, um, storage facilities. Um, where there's no people um, and they kind of move around these giant shelves that sit on top of these units and then people um, come and to a kind of a safer zone because this is uh, what's known as a human exclusion zone these places where these shelves are moved around they're very big and very heavy um, and then uh, humans can kind of come and pick off uh, the right product and then they kind of go back into this um, organizing system and the cage is supposed to be some kind of version where humans can enter that zone um, and instead of a shelf, you have this cage. Um, and so I thought, wow, what an amazing symbol, also highlighted by uh, Kate and Vladen. Um, and then I thought, hmm, wouldn't it be interesting, uh, along those lines of kind of feeling something that's a bit intangible, uh, to actually make some version of this drawing into a kind of cage that you can see and experience. Um, so I went to a very talented uh, metal workshop in Berlin um, and said, can we, can we make this? Um, and, uh, and this is what we uh, produced um, in the factory there, a little, um, and this is kind of what it ended up looking like. Um, these are images from the installation uh, in um, uh, Tasmania at the Museum of Old and New Art. Um, you can see, uh, this is a detail of the object. We left also on these kind of um, numbers, which are often used to produce um, uh, pattern drawings. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a genre of drawing where you have these kind of like, um, annotated images. And I thought to kind of show the connection between the, the kind of virtual imagination and the kind of intellectual property capture of that document and uh, still kind of keep it in the room, um, I would keep those uh, on there um, as a kind of uncanny, I don't know, remnant of its origin. Um, but as I was talking to uh, uh, people making the show, uh, Jared Rawlins, I see is also in the room. He's the curator I worked with uh, in Tasmania. We thought it would be really incredible to kind of activate this object in, um, in another way as well, not just have a static version of this cage, but also have some interaction inside the cage. And, um, you know, uh, at the Museum of Old and New Art, it's all underground. It feels very mine-like. Um, and the theme of the show was kind of around extraction. Um, and so uh, we immediately thought of the kind of metaphor of the canary in the coal mine, this idea of a sentinel bird kind of telling human workers that something is toxic. Um, and uh, we thought around, um, yeah, what kind of bird is an interesting kind of dialogue in, uh, in Australia. Um, and we came to um, this bird, uh, which um, was making the news at the time uh, as the most likely bird in Australia to become completely extinct. And as we all know, um, because of largely uh, industrial um, action, uh, uh, or rather industrial practices in the world, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, species becoming extinct. It's a mass extinction age. Um, and the King Island brown thornbill uh, was thought to be the kind of uh, most endangered um, animal uh, bird in Australia. We got in touch with um, a research agency um, from the Australian National University who were working on documenting um, these birds um, and managed to get some of the uh, production money uh, from the show to support um, a special documenting of the, the sound that this uh, bird was making and the way that it moved so that we could render a kind of an animation of that bird uh, to go kind of inside or in dialogue with the cage. Um, and it's a very special sound. I think I can play it here.
And until that moment, it had never been uh, kind of assigned that science that sound uh, to this particular animal. So it was a very special moment um, in the production of that exhibition and of this piece. Um, and this is what the uh, piece looked like in Mona. And um, you can just get a sense here also of how we put that bird kind of into the cage. Um, everybody at, at Mona uses a screen um, because uh, this is the way that you get around the museum. So if you don't bring your own uh, iPhone, um, they kind of provide you with one. And this is perfect for augmented reality experiences. So we designed an augmented reality experience um, for the cage, uh, which brought this bird into dialogue with it or a virtual avatar of it. So this is kind of what it looked like. Kind of cute, kind of sweet, very small uh, bird roaming around inside this cage. Um, and so this is what it would look like through the screen. But when lots of people were doing it, it was quite an uncanny thing too, because you were kind of looking blankly at the screen and all of these bird calls were around, um, which you could hear. So that was really weird because you were seeing people kind of, yeah, looking at this worker cage with the sound of these birds, possibly more bird sounds than are actually on the planet of this particular bird's call at the moment, um, but in this kind of really insane um, way. So uh, I thought that was a really uh, wonderful, um, yeah, talking to these themes of who uh, is working for whom and how these hierarchies work and, you know, uh, a lot of uh, themes that um, Anna already mentioned. Um, uh, and from that patent, that was not the only uh, things that I produced uh, in that series. Um, I was also really uh, fascinated with the materiality of the patent itself, right? So it's this legal document. It's kind of quite boring looking in some ways, um, but it has these very evocative diagrams on it um, and also very evocative language if you go into it as well. And so the more I started kind of shifting around paper printouts of that material, the more I felt that there was something that I needed to do with the, with the patent itself, right? Rather than just the drawing. Um, and I had been looking into like obsolete, uh, recently obsolete 3D printing technology. Um, this was the star of the Consumer Electronics Show in 2014, uh, which was uh, the, this giant machine that was supposed to take normal A4 paper and kind of turn it into um, 3D printing as a way to, for example, avoid a lot of the plastic use that um, is happening in 3D printing, a kind of, uh, yeah. It was a very interesting machine, but it takes literally two days <laughs> to print um, one print. So uh, it's not, it wasn't a huge commercial success, um, but there's a, a very special collector of these machines, keeping two of them running in Leipzig, uh, in Germany of all places. And I reached out to them and said, hey, would you work with me doing something slightly unusual with this machine? Um, this is what it was designed for. So appropriately, this is a, a 3D printed um, uh, Facebook thumb, um, uh, which uh, is, is made out of these uh, paper stacks. Um, and here's a face being kind of um, also removed from one. So you can do kind of full color prints on them. They're quite amazing uh, machines. Um, but I wanted to work with it in a way where I kept both the imagery from the patent of it and a kind of shape uh, from the patent uh, as well. And I'll show you what that means. Like um, this is how it works. It's basically stacks of stacks of paper and stacks of very strategically put together glue and kind of like cutting machines that make up a shape in the middle of it. Um, yeah, this is kind of how it looks when it's running. So you can see why that's really slow. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is the kind of, you know, what I did is I put an image of the cage, a very simplified one into that, and then kind of uh, use that to print it out. Um, so this is also the, the computer interface that runs with that machine, which is also kind of very, uh, yeah, rudimentary. Uh, you then kind of like take the block and like un un unravel the inside of it. So I thought it was really interesting because it's both an additive sculptural process and a, and, a, and a subtractive one. Um, so quite interesting from a sculptural perspective. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the machine. Um, so just a big block. 
um, and then I kind of work back in, um, but keep some of the images there. So what you get in the end is this um, kind of layered part, which is like half finished from the perspective of the machine, where a little part of uh, that, um, that diagram is kind of emerging from stacks and stacks of printed um, uh, uh, material. And um, this one is actually in the exhibition as well um, uh, at, the, uh, at the UQ Museum. Um, and uh, this is kind of how that looks. Um, it's also uh, kind of in dialogue uh, here um, with uh, some amazing drawings that were done and, uh, and a board game that I designed. But I don't know how we're doing for time. Um, and like, should I continue talking about yeah. this part? Or? Yeah, I think you can um, talk a little bit more maybe about um, how, yeah, how, how we've um, expanded um, the presentation at Mona and um, how it's become a kind of a playable object and perhaps some of the correlations between mineral mining and data mining. For sure. Okay, so <clears throat> this is an installation here um, from what is at the UQ Museum. Um, so uh, I, I worked with some very talented people on uh, making a kind of playable game table next to a sculpture that is there um, from the uh, Mona Mine um, uh, exhibition, which is this giant uh, train that has uh, versions of this uh, board game in it, um, Extractor, which was another kind of special project uh, produced for, for, for Mona there, um, based on this game. Uh, Squatter, which uh, some of you may have played if you're uh, in the region. Um, very popular game, supposedly. Some Australians have never heard of it, but others have. Um, and it's a kind of gamified, supposedly, version of like uh, a market of um, a sheep farming. So you collect little sheep uh, and you kind of develop them, uh, develop land uh, that is otherwise natural. Um, and then you kind of harvest your sheep uh, for profit. Uh, and I uh, adapted that um, into basically the same mechanic, you know, very similar game, but the theme instead of sheep is kind of like data mining, um, data harvesting. Um, yeah, this is kind of what the object looks like. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when it's kind of played. So uh, amazingly, you kind of stack up uh, data on these kind of um, little stackable uh, things. You kind of cover up a bird, uh, this, in this case, in the shape of a, of a tweet logo. Um, but also kind of in dialogue with the, with the cage. Um, and as a player, uh, you are a kind of anthropomorphic robot made of screens, which is based on this Nandrum Pike uh, piece. Um, so you're kind of rolling around uh, trying to, uh, yeah, extract as much as you can from this uh, data system. Um, and uh, so again, uh, back, to the, back to the installation uh, at the at UQ Museum. Um, this is people playing uh, on this very special table that we designed, uh, which is um, a cardboard cutout similar to the um, uh, uh, materiality of the rest of that show um, uh, that I made um, based on a couple of different designs. Um, so uh, here I have to mention another very special collaborator in this exhibition, which is um, Sharon Gordon, who is an amazing artist based in Brisbane. Uh, and she... Uh, graciously uh, for a few versions of uh, this exhibition has produced some kind of fantastic uh, courtroom sketches. She's uh, an, a painter who does many things, but one of the things that she does um, is produce courtroom sketches inside of courtrooms. Um, and in a way, kind of thinking about uh, some of the sculptures that I made which were of uh, uh, mining machines, um, I thought, how, what is a way to kind of visualize uh, uh, the people that work with them and, and kind of what their relationship is to ownership and all these kinds of themes. And so I, I asked Sharon to produce um, speculative uh, drawings of uh, how uh, it might be if the people that made uh, the mining machines um, would be on trial for something um, in, the, in the Australian legal system. Uh, so here you have a group of people from Rio Tinto uh, on trial uh, at the Supreme Court. Um, uh, we produced another special one um, because uh, after we made this diagram, I think uh, in 2020, um, there was actually a court case with Rio Tinto. Um, and we did another version um, of what that might look like uh, under the conditions um, of, uh, of, of COVID. Um, so a kind of a video trial. And then an image also of the Supreme Court um, in Australia. Um, and then uh, I thought it would be really interesting to take that image of the Supreme Court 
and pop it out into the room so that you could play the extractor board game on a version of the Supreme Court furniture. Um, so uh, here is this cardboard version of the Supreme Court furniture as a, as a kind of gaming table for extractor. Um, and uh, it's a very special thing. Another little detail before I close, um, uh, the seats are based on the seats for, uh, that are in the Supreme Court, but they're also um, using a design for a children's chair uh, that was active in the 80s at McDonald's. Uh, so that, that, uh, that's, uh, that's one kind of uh, uh, little secret reference uh, in there. But uh, maybe that's enough uh, for me and, um, and perhaps we can talk to Lisa. Thanks, Simon. Um, that's fantastic. And I think it's great to have the broader context of the installation um, at UQ as well. And I think uh, particularly what that installation allows us to do, um, and, and particularly the watercolours, I think, is, um, yeah, it, it opens up a window that enables us to think through, you know, what could happen if the big tech disru disruptors, um, you know, like Facebook, Apple, whoever, um, are sort of held accountable um, in the way that, um, you know, some mining companies like Rio Tinto are currently, um, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, such a fantastic work and really important um, to think about yeah, the ramifications of, um, of labor and, um, and the fact that it's bodies, um, actually bodies, you know, working with robots in this sort of machinic ballet, as you said, and um, how terrifying that is actually as a vision of our present. I mean, it's not too far from the present reality, even though the cage was never made. I think, you know, Amazon certainly has a whole array of really oppressive technologies, um, like the Zen booth meditation kiosk, which is so weird, or the um, kind of wrist um, devices that sort of nudge workers towards a particular object and those um, really massive, you know, airplane hangar sized warehouses where things are kept in such opaque algorithmic order that um, they just have to almost roboticize bodies and space, I guess. Um, we're going to talk now uh, to Elisa Gigina Papa, um, whose work is really also revealing the anonymous digital workforce um, particularly in relation to click workers. Elisa, would you like to take over from here? Sure. Cool. Um, let me try to share my screen. Sounds good. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, okay, <laughs> great. So hello to everybody. Um, of course, happy to be here and to talk a little bit about my work. Uh, and thank you, Anna, for the invitation. And also happy to share the screen with Simon. Uh, so nice to hear you talk about your work. Um, and okay, so on my part, um, I guess I want to focus a quick presentation on the work that is uh, uh, included in the Don't Be Evil show, uh, and that is titled Cleaning Emotional Data. Um, and Cleaning Emotional Data is part of a trilogy of video installations that I started in uh, 2016, and that is, uh, and I just finished in 2020, uh, and is dedicated with, uh, to the relation between care labor and uh, um, artificial intelligence. Uh, so I'll really quickly talk about the two other projects and then I'll just focus on uh, cleaning emotional data. Um, so the first one was labor and sleep. Have you, been, have you been able to change your habits? And it was a piece that was commissioned to me by the uh, Whitney Museum of American Art uh, for the Sunrise Sunset series. Uh, and there's a piece that addresses the politics and the economies of sleep and self-care in relation to 24-7 capitalism. 24-7 uh, was a book written by 
prairie uh, and it's basically talking like I use like some of uh, uh, the tea or the book to as an inspiration for uh, the video work uh, and the main topic was a, a non-stop process of contemporary capitalism right so how the topic so the topic of how um, digital global economies are pushing us towards a non-stop restless um, activity um, and then the second project was uh, technologies of care um, and technologies of care is uh, also video installation um, and it uh, explores the ways in which affect and care labor are being outsourced via uh, internet platform. Uh, the piece is based on a conversation that I had with uh, basically precarious workers who provide care labor online. Uh, so to give you quickly some examples, I had a conversation with an uh, uh, ASMR artist uh, or an online dating coach, a fetish, a fetish video performer, uh, a fairy tale author a social media fan for hire so for example this is a, a little fragment of uh, the uh, worker tune the social media fan for hire so for five dollars you could hire her uh, to basically deliver clicks uh, uh, or comments on your social media profile and she uh, works from greece uh, or for example customer service uh, operators uh, so therefore i'm talking about anonymous uh, freelancers uh, gig workers whom through a variety of platforms, so website apps, uh, provide clients be, with uh, uh, customized goods uh, and experience, uh, also erotic simulation, companionship and emotional support. Uh, and it might be important to say that when I'm talking about care labor, I really go from sex work uh, uh, to uh, companionship or, for example, emotional support. I don't make uh, any strict, uh, strict difference. Uh, and then also among the stories that I collected, there are uh, those of uh, non-human caregivers. Uh, so at one point, uh, talking with a lot of uh, gig workers who deliver care service online, I also started to talk with uh, algorithms, um, chatbots. Uh, so for example, the episode seven of uh, the video is dedicated to worker seven, that is uh, uh, a bot uh, that I call virtual boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, and, the, and this part of the video is based on a conversation that I had with this chatbot that is called the invisible boyfriend and uh, that is basically performing emotional labor by simulating emotional intelligence uh, and this I guess was a little bit a turning point in the research because uh, when I started to talk with the chat but I really believed it was a chatbot. But then after a while, I actually discovered that was not a chatbot. That it means that the company initially planned to create this algorithm that could be uh, deliver like emotional labor, let's say, uh, so chat with you in terms of like a romantic relationship. But then when this, when they understood, they discovered that it was actually economically advantageous to hire gig workers instead, they switched uh, to gig workers. So, so it means basically that uh, now the invisible boyfriend or girlfriend, so this specific service of chatbot, uh, is actually um, a cluster of gig workers that are working mainly from the global south and that basically alternatively connect to the uh, account of the client to perform uh, this uh, tireless love giver uh, and tireless love uh, companion. So it is like really this kind of like invisible labor that is, uh, uh, is, all, is um, Listen, I mean, I think we can even use the word surrogate, right? So the, basically these workers are working as a surrogate for this idea of an artificial, artificial intelligence that will be developed enough to have a proper conversation, if not an emotional conversation with uh, you. Totally. Um, Jeff Bezos sort of talks sorry? about it as like um, Jeff Bezos sort of talks about it as like artificial artificial intelligence, right? It's um, yeah, this invisible human, you know, labor force uh, behind AI, um, because the AI actually isn't working. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the problem about artificial intelligence exactly is it is not is not working or is not working as is marketed, uh, particularly like around uh, California. And most of artificial intelligence is supported by what I call the invisible human infrastructure that is uh, allowing the development and the functioning of the artificial intelligence. And this is really the topic that then I started to develop for the last project of the trilogy that is uh, cleaning emotional data. Um, and as I said, human emotional data like really focus on the invisible human infrastructure that is sustaining uh, uh, automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, and specifically, uh, I try to understand more with this project about the extensive uh, and uh, decentralized workforce of uh, data cleaners uh, that are contracted by so-called uh, human in the loop companies to process uh, uh, data that are related used to train machine vision systems so that are later used to train machine to see. Um, so basically these workers uh, connected from globally uh, but mainly from the global south uh, right are labeling categorizing annotating and validating massive amounts of data thereby enabling artificial intelligence to function. So the majority of the uh, human in the loop companies are based in uh, uh, let's say the global north most of them in uh, uh, California and the majority of the workers are based on a uh, uh, global south uh, in the global south uh, so just to give you an idea of the geopolitics of uh, this kind of invisible labor right and, and here I put like um, a slide uh, uh, with a screenshot from one of the companies that I researched uh, uh, that is happening and they also they're calling themselves human in the loop and they are saying to offer uh, data with a human touch. This is for AI, artificial intelligence company, right? Uh, and for me, of course, what is interesting here is that this data with a human touch really means uh, uh, data with a touch, uh, data that are cleaned and processed by uh, underpaid workers. So that is a human touch. Um, sorry? I was just going to say, um, I think it's probably worth unpacking what human in the loop actually means for people too, because um, it's certainly a term that I came across, you know, when I was researching the show and didn't really understand it, but um, it sort of just means, um, yeah, where you can leverage human and machine intelligences together at the same time, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so that, because uh, you, can't, you can't have pure machine intelligence in this, in this instance. Anyway, sorry, please carry on. Right. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not until now, at least. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so basically, actually, this project started as a um, researcher for my PhD at UC Berkeley. I'm an artist, but I also like theory quite a lot, and I like to research. And so I'm also finishing a PhD at UC Berkeley. Um, but at the time, actually, I was back in Palermo, uh, and uh, that is originally where I'm from, and actually is where I am right now. Um, and so I was doing some research on machine vision systems. And while doing this research, I ended up myself becoming a, a data cleaner for about uh, three months. Uh, I, at one point, like I understood that that was for me the best way to really understand this kind of like invisible process that is uh, behind these uh, artificial intelligence systems. Uh, and so that experience ended up uh, basically informing, but also becoming uh, the last piece of this trilogy of artworks. Uh, and in the in clinic emotion data, I basically document part of the labor that I did and that is involved in training machine vision systems to see. Um, here what you're seeing are all fragments of these tasks that I did during those three months. And so to give you some example, uh, for example, one of the tasks that I repeated over and over again is image uh, segmentation. So for machine vision uh, algorithms, that are using, for example, for self-driving cars and other similar systems. So what I would do is uh, to outline object boundaries with uh, polygonal, uh, polygonal uh, circuits and then label them. 
right? So basically tracing, bounding, and naming. Uh, that was an operation that I repeated over and over again. So tracing borders uh, to distinguish what belonged to what, uh, and then name that uh, predefined taxonomic uh, uh, belonging. Um, and as I was saying at the time, I was living in Palermo, uh, and uh, I remember that after full hours of uh, tracing and labeling, I would go out, for example, in the city for walks, uh, and uh, without even realizing, I would start to like name and visually enclose objects, and I would be particularly bothered by occlusion, obstructions. So in other words, my eyes uh, kept trying to reimpose a uh, an order of things, right? The order of things. Uh, but um, the problem is, I don't know how much familiar you are with uh, Palermo or such uh, Italian cities in general. I know Simon went to Palermo. We were having, uh, talking about this uh, at the beginning. Uh, but I would say that they definitely defy uh, any external orderly impulse any logic of capture and control, right? That is, if you try to grasp them, they might end up grasping you instead. Uh, that is, if you, like, if I imagine a self-driving Google car trying to go around uh, the street of Palermo, for example, of Ballero, that is a market uh, neighborhood where I'm living right now, uh, I can I cannot but laugh, right? It's just like it would be a failure. The old city, <laughs> how the city function will not allow for that kind of like rational order uh, to function in uh, this uh, street. So for me, it was quite important actually to do this project back in Palermo and not in California. Um, Anyway, other tasks that I did while I was uh, a data cleaner were also related to affective computing. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, labeling and rating the uh, emotions uh, in faces uh, to train algorithms that supposedly are programmed to uh, detect emotions in uh, human. Um, or for example, to animate uh, 3D avatars with my own emotions. Uh, like in this case, I was supposed to animate a zebra uh, expressing with my face uh, uh, ah, a surprise, uh, affect. Uh, or this one was a bat and I was supposed to express a disgusted, uh, disgusted uh, affect. I don't think I did a great work with this one. But, um, and then I also started to produce videos of my um, emotional expressions that were later used to create uh, affective computing data sets. Um, and I guess this was a little bit of a turning point in the research and then also in the project. Uh, because right at the beginning, when I started to produce these short videos of my facial expressions and then submitting them, uh, some of them were rejected. Right, so it seems that my um, expression of certain emotions were not uh, matching the crude categories in which they were supposed to fit in. So my face was not happy enough, nor happy in the right way, I'm not sure. Um, but also what I'm not sure about and I couldn't understand is uh, if the rejection came from an algorithm that was kind of like testing the videos that I was submitting, or for example, another gig workers that as me was like working on this cluster of uh, uh, data and, and uh, submission, video submission, who, for example, might uh, have understood my facial expression uh, in a different way, maybe due to uh, cultural differences. Right. Um, so after the rejection of those videos, I became more and more interested in the logic and in the theories and methods underpinning the taxonomization of emotions within machine vision. Um, so the question for me really became, how do machines uh, recognize emotions? And we're basically back to the 19th century um, with uh, Duchenne de Bologna, Darwin, and physiognomy. 
right? That is, we're back to uh, the myth of universality, of uh, transparency, and of uh, uh, truth, according to which emotions are universal and they can be fully revealed, uh, made transparent, reduced, and measured within an ideal scale that can provide the ground to make comparison and judgment. So, for example, to use Eduardo Glissant, that is a theorist from Martinique and poet uh, that I is, is quite important. It was quite important for me to read in that period. Uh, no opacity is allowed, right? It's a system that like try to work on transparency that is imposing transparency. So whatever like is your emotional uh, life uh, inside, according to this system, is uh, uh, made transparent through your uh, facial expressions. So in this uh, kind of like framework, uh, uh, emotional states are reduced uh, to discrete uh, facial, mus facial muscles uh, movement uh, that can be separated, uh, named, uh, and reduced to their small, uh, smallest unit units possible, and then recombine to be classified, right? And, and, and what you're seeing here are the experiments of uh, um, the French neurologist Duchenne de Bologna, uh, that made these experiments in the 19th century, uh, 1870s, basically, uh, by triggering the facial muscul mus muscular uh, contraction of his patients. Uh, and there could be, so basically, it was doing this kind of like uh, uh, small, elect like shocks, electric shocks uh, to the faces and muscles, and of course there could be a lot to say about Duchenne relationship to his patients in terms of power dynamic, right? But anyway, his stated intent was to create a universal map of emotions. And sorry, like I made a little bit this uh, um, historical path uh, because basically uh, the same method is used today, only slightly revised, in the Paul Ekman FACS method. So the facial action coding systems method, method that is used today by uh, the CIA, the FBI, the TSA to uh, detect uh, deception in facial expressions uh, and is also widely implemented in uh, uh, face recognition and machine vision. Not exactly the same method and of course it's a method that is heavily criticized but it's basically uh, the same logic, right? Uh, and it's also used for CGI animations uh, with uh, uh, quite uncanny valley effects uh, like this one. Uh, and likewise, the same logic is used uh, for the animoji uh, of uh, uh, the smartphones, right? So to animate the emoji, uh, what they call animoji. Um, so basically, it's a method that is crossing the military, industrial, uh, surveillance, spectacle, tech industry complex. Uh, so from the 19th century physiognomy to Hollywood and then directly to their phone and then directly to the FBI. Uh, this is kind of like the connection that I try to make. Um, Okay, so this, I guess, is to say that it doesn't really matter, right, how infantilizing, but uh, also really cute the application that you're using is, uh, uh, the logic that underpins and fuels emotion recognitions, uh, recognition algorithms uh, is still based on anti century science and on the need of uh, transparency, uh, truth, and universality, in which universality is always, of course, a proxy for uh, the white uh, Western hetero uh, men. And um, Okay, so all this research became uh, this video essay that is uh, um, basically, it became a video installation. The video essay is divided in uh, a three channel video installation, uh, in which on one end I collected uh, um, the tasks uh, that I performed uh, as a data cleaner, and then, so all basically those short fragments that you saw. Uh, while I was talking a little bit of uh, the research and the process of making uh, uh, the video. And, and then on the other hand, I'm tracing uh, and critiquing uh, um, the history of emotion recognition starting from the 19th century and 
uh, reaching I mean, uh, today with the artificial intelligence uh, uh, systems. Um, and maybe I'll uh, uh, can give you some details uh, quickly and then I close uh, about the formal choices of the video installations. Um, so basically the three videos are playing in uh, monitors that are uh, protected by a privacy filter. Uh, so the privacy filter is basically, for example, what you see, actually you don't see, you're not supposed to see when you go through the security check or the passport check at the airport. If you try to look at the monitor of uh, the officers that are checking your uh, passport, you, you can never see the monitor, right? You just see this like dark screen. Uh, in my case, I found this gold pink uh, privacy screen. I decided to use uh, those. And basically, they uh, obscure the screen with um, a gradient beyond, beyond a certain angle of viewing. That is, if you're like uh, at the same height of the monitor, you can see through, so you can see the monitor, so you can see uh, the videos. But then if you go a little bit up, so basically if you're standing, if you're not uh, going down, uh, you can see, you cannot see uh, what is inside uh, the monitor. And this is, of course, a little bit of a metaphor of uh, uh, the invisible label, right? On the surface, you have this uh, sleek, a gold shiny um, interface uh, and then behind you have all the labor that is you're not supposed to know about you're not uh, supposed to uh, to see yeah uh, it's a very um it's a very seductive installation actually in the space with these sort of big gold panels and these um you know neon cords that are almost like umbilical cords or something and then yeah the sort of surface um of the privacy screen as you say and then learning about this um sort of insidious um human infrastructure yeah thank you um that's it's such a sensational work. Um, we're running out of time. We've only got a few minutes. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the most extraordinary things about this work um, was, you know, this reference that you make to like the taxonomization of human emotions. And, um, you know, I keep thinking about that in relation to, to AI. And there's another work in the show by Sean Dockray where he talks about um, how Google bought YouTube in 2016 so they could capture all of the sounds in the world. and um, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, AI just capturing all of the sounds and all of the images and all of the emotions. It's this kind of like neo-colonial drive almost. Um, that's quite terrifying. Um, but uh, I don't know. Are there any quick questions from the audience that people would like to ask in the last few minutes to either Simon or Elisa? Okay, I have a quick question. Um, Elisa, when you were um, working in the for the Human in the Loop system, um, for the Human in the Loop company as a click worker, and you were annotating uh, the different data, in the gallery space at the moment, um, we have images of, of dogs with the orifices being coloured in, and um, also images of, um, you know, bounding boxes around people. Um, and I wondered um, what sort of, um, what sort of AI training sets were you making um, at that point? And did they ever tell you what you were making? Uh, no, and I guess this is like uh, an important topic, right, to be discussed about this kind of artificial, artificial intelligence, the human behind the machine, because you have no idea who you're working for, and you have no idea how your work is going to be used. There was like, for example, this uh, news like a month ago, maybe one year ago, uh, about uh, how like all these workers, gig workers discovered at the end that they were kind of like cleaning data and like uh, reorganizing in data for this algorithm that then was used for like drones, right? So these people didn't have any idea uh, about, you know, what they were using the data for and cleaning the data for. So that is another problem about mm. uh, the gig economy. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to have to close now. It's been so, such a riveting presentation for both of you. Um, I just should probably mention that um, Elisa's, uh, a number of Elisa's video works are on display um, on the website We Met Online. Um, the works that she mentioned um, 
from the series Technologies of Care. And um, of course, Simon's works on display at UQ Art Museum, as is Elisa's um, Cleaning Emotional Data. And the show is open until the 22nd of January, 2022. Um, and watch the space for the publication as well. Thank you everyone from all around the world for joining us. Um, it's been really great and um, so lovely to have you all here. And thank you, Simon and Elisa. So. Thank you. <laughs> have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.